Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club, you're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell from the Hawthorne Footy Club, and you're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. Welcome back to another episode of the 50 Most Relevant, where we work our way through who I think are the most relevant players in 2022 across your fantasy formats. Yep, we put Supercoach, Dream Team, and AFL Fantasy. We smash them all together. So for some players that you see through this 50, you might believe they're too low, MJ. Others you think are too high. Some shouldn't even factor. It's because we try to make it for the coaches panel, fans and family members and Patreons that get involved. We play multi-formats. We love it and we want to get involved in all the formats. So it's a one-stop shop conversation in the preseason, the 50 most relevant. Today, a fascinating breakout candidate that has coaches absolutely frothing at his potential, especially in a couple of formats. And if you do play keeper leagues, you might have a little bit of bias seeping through. I'm talking about Fremantle docker Caleb Sarong. Joining me on this episode, it's been a couple of days since we've had him. We've got to get him back. I've got Jordox, mate. Hello, mate. How are you? I'm good, mate. Good to be back again. It's good to have you back. And uh, there's a lot to like about Caleb Sarong. There's also a few quite big red flags that I don't think are getting discussed enough through the preseason. We'll try to give you as balanced a take as we can to give you the information you need to make the most informed decision about whether or not he's right or wrong for your fantasy side. 20 years of age, heading into the mythical third year breakout, midfielder yet again in 2022. And last year in AFL Fantasy and Supercoach, he gave us his career high scores It was 143 against the North Melbourne Kangaroos in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team and a 135 against Crosstown Rivals, the Eagles in Supercoach. His averages actually pretty similar uh, across the formats, not just this season, but also if you contrast it to last year as well. Really almost identical. It was an 82.4 in Dream Team and Fantasy and 82.9 in Supercoach. In that format, he's priced just over $450,000. In AFL Fantasy, 691 k and just a squeeze over 700000 for Dream Team coaches. And Jordox, you've been playing fantasy footy for a long time. Many of the coaches panel listeners have been doing the same. There are some really satisfying moments we can have as fantasy coaches. And probably one of the most satisfying is calling a breakout for a player and getting on it and it delivering premium performances. And this preseason, that hype is very much real for Caleb Sarong this year. Absolutely, MJ. It is one of the greatest feelings when you when you get a guy in and no one else sort of does and then later in the year, everyone's scrambling to get him in and they're paying uh, a heap more for him. And in many, many of those areas we look at, Sarong fits the bill. I mean, the, the, the fabled third year breakout, um, the, the fact that he's um, in the midfield at a young developing side that's on the way up and the fact that even this year, we'll touch on this in a little bit, he, he actually spent some time in a run with role, tagging role. Yeah. Now, I always get excited when I see players, natural ball winners like a Sarong play as a tagger because, you know, one, it means it keeps their price down and their average down for the next year. But it, it does teach them, if you want to be the best, you've got to learn how to stop the best. Yeah. It's a a fascinating player when we look into what his year split like, because you're right for the, for really long portions of the year, there were moments where Caleb Sarong did play that accountable footy through the midfield. Um, And it was really, really intriguing to watch Longmuir give him that opportunity for, for a record. I actually think that was a really nice development tool, which you alluded to before, but from a fantasy footy perspective, Um, It was a tale of two stories for coaches when you drill down into the numbers. Um, He started the year probably not as strong as those that were bullish on the second year breakout, which, by the way, that's rarefied air that happens, that a guy in their second year becomes a premium. We're talking Jack McRae. We're talking Nat Fife. We're talking Clayton Oliver. 
And that's just about it. Like the CV of people that do that is very, very rare. Um, it's why I'm always hesitant to go for the second year breakout. Um, but from a scoring point last year, he did average 82.3 in Dream Team and Fantasy. Five tons across the year. Four of them were over 115. So that's some nice ceiling. He's not getting too many low hundreds for us there. And that personal best that we've already alluded to, that 143. He did have four additional scores over 80. While in Supercoach, he averaged 82.8 over the year. Seven tons. Three of them over 115, including that PB 135. And an additional five scores over 80 plus. Sure. Maybe not great. I get, And, and you know what? In totality, it's not. But what's got coaches excited entering into this new year is not just the mythic third-year breakout, is that we saw some trends towards the back of 2021 that make this feel justified for coaches. In the last five games uh, in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team, he averaged 104, while in the final three, it was 117. In Supercoach, the last... Um, seven games of five games of the year. It was that average of 107, but 117 over the last three. And I think Jordox, that's what's got coaches this preseason super excited. They see a guy priced in the early 80s and hoping that even if it is only three to five and a small games of sampling, that's the thing that has coaches going, I could have 20 to 30 points of value here and I might jag myself a premium at an absolute discount. Absolutely. Nothing gets us more excited than that that tail end of a season where a player just goes pop. And and like you said, he finished the year with three scores in the, you know, 100 teams. So 118, 117, 116 in three yeah, teams. DTA. Yeah. Um, and what was interesting about that run was uh, the game before as well. Mm. The last four rounds, Nat, Nat Feist didn't play. And I know Feist's been playing more forward and, um, but I'm just seeing a bit of leadership coming from this guy. He, yeah. he in the second last game, he won the the uh, medal in the derby. Yep. Um, for best on ground performance, um, and so it's not just the numbers. It's seeing this kid grow. Looking at his numbers for the whole year, I did find an interesting trend. Um, yeah. Where for no, nine consecutive weeks, right between round seven and sixteen, he failed to reach twenty disposals. So to me, that was a red flag. But when you look into it, that was the time when he was doing his run with Roll. Yeah, and yeah, one of those games was on Merritt. He, he, he ran with Zach Merritt. I mean, what a great player to learn from. Mm. And he did a great job. He, he you know, he kept him very um, restricted. And then, so that was the nine games. And then he reached 20 plus disposals in every other game, including five over 30. So yeah, you can nice. see there's sort of, you know, he spent a bit of time tagging, and then when he was released, he he found the footy, um, and that's the sort of thing that yeah has got me. And, and I think that's what coaches are looking at. You've talked about that tail end of a year. It, it's been almost a locked in formula that coaches look out of third year breakout and how did they end the year? The uh, the things we look at guys like an Aaron Hall when he was back at Gold Coast when he had that midfield role and he showed over six, seven, eight weeks that he could score a hundred and he ended up delivering similar into the new year. We've seen Josh Dunkley do that before. Um, Jack Steele, Seb Ross, um, others to have also done very, very similar guys like Toby McLean um, and, and even Sam Walsh to some extent at the back of 2020 gave coaches that confidence that 2021 was going to be a strong scoring year. And so this is the narrative of what has got coaches super excited about him. And then a really significant variable has changed in that Fremantle side over the past couple of months. Via the trade period, Adam Chera has moved out of the side. And Jordox, by osmosis, coaches go, well, he, he was in he was in it probably, I think he was the clubhouse leader, Sarong, for, for CBAs last year. Like it was, he was one of the best. And part of that is because of that defensive role that you alluded to before. But I think that's what has people going, he had more, more ball winning role, another preseason. And now there's space with Chera moved out for him to be the number two guy behind Brayshaw. What does that mean 
from a Sarong perspective, will we see a numerical increase from your take? Yeah, it's, it's something we always look for, isn't it? When there's a big, um, a big name player moves on, moves on, it's like, okay, what opportunities does that now create for who's left? And Chera, you know, I think they're probably similar age, but Chera was probably a year or two ahead. years older, yeah. Development. Yep. So he's now gone. Other things I've looked at is, you know, Fife is, is going to play more forward, we think. Um, they're going to continue to keep the kids in there. Mm-hmm. And even Mundy, who, you know, beggars to believe how he's still going and churning out the numbers he does, Mundy. Um, but you'd think they'd start to shift him out as well. Um, but from a statistical point of view and, and in terms of scores, last season, 2021, uh, Chera missed four games for the season, mm. which is uh, great in that, okay, there's a little bit we can look at there um, and it's pretty positive. So um, when Chera played, um, Sarong played 18 games with him mm-hmm. and in AFL Fantasy Dream Team, he averaged 78. Okay. In the four ga- the four games that Chera missed in AFL Dream Team, Sarong averaged one oh one. So there's two ways you can look at it, right? One is, you know, I think sometimes we like to cherry pick stats to suit what of we're course. looking for. Um, so if you're bullish on Sarong and and you wanted to, you know, convince yourself that Chera gone is a good thing, this will work. You do have to remember, though, that some of those games, you know, that's 18 games versus four games. So yeah, samples are small. It, it, yeah, and a lot of the other games where Chera was there, Sarong would have been tagging. And so there's all these things. But I will say this. He's hit 35 disposals twice in his career, mm. um, Sarong, and both times was in 2021 when Chera wasn't playing. Ooh, take, with, take from that what you will. It does... Bring confidence to that narrative. The for those that play Super Coach, it's about an eight points per game bump in those four matches where he does score more. So again, still not quite at the ninety territory there. So it's certainly not as as a larger jump uh, as Jordox has alluded there. But I, I think when I look at um, Caleb Sarong, uh, and we do as the coaches panel, we look at all of the formats. The jump from a guy at eighty two. Let's take the limited trade formats of Supercoach and Dream Team and put them together and then we'll deal with AFL fans. For him to be a viable starting squad guy for you, it has to work. And what I mean by work is he has to push an average of 105 because normally it's the third year breakout is where you flirt with around that 100 marker, but it's the fourth year where it's like, oh, yeah, I know I belong. I know I'm stronger. I know I'm healthy. And, and I am a dominant midfielder. And that's where you see an Andrew, Andrew Brayshaw sort of scoring trend continue on. It is rare that you get it in the second, let alone the third. And, and so if, if in those formats you're not confident, he can build his scoring by 25 points per game and be a 105 midfielder, I don't think you can start him. You've got to do that because 15 points per game of value to push him to a 95, it's not enough in any year, let alone when you've got value options like an Elliot Yo or a Matt Cratch that, yes, have injury concerns over them, absolutely, over their history. But they're also proven 105, 110, 115 guys for stretches. And so can you really start a sceptical guy that you hope might get 20 to 25 points per game of bump over guys that you know, if fit, will give you 20 to 25 points per game bump. The only thing that would make you do is go, I love the new feel. I I love the new fashion of Sarong over the old and dated yo. And you want to, you want to have that feeling we talked about at the start of picking someone as they break out. And, uh, you know, you said something before that was so true about, it's often that fourth year or fifth year, you know, um, and that, how often do you either say yourself or hear your friends say, oh, I was a year early. Now okay. everyone else is doing it. I was a year early. And, and it does have that feel. I mean, a lot of people would have jumped on Sarong in 2021, hoping yeah. for a second year um, breakout. Yeah. I, I, for me, I look in those formats. I just go with the value we have in so many different lines and then add to that. Go back and actually look at how many midfielders 
averaged over 105 last year in, in AFL Fantasy and Dream Team. And how many went 110 plus in Supercoach last year? It, it's actually quite a significant number of players that you're looking at going, can he get towards them? Now, of course, can he? The answer is, of course, yeah, he can. But the 15th best midfielder last year in AFL Fantasy was Ben Keys with a 108. So even if he got to 105, it's not top. Now, again, Kane and I spoke about this, you know, on different podcasts where it's more about what you pay for, where you get them, and they don't have to be among the top. But it's the point of he needs to get up towards that to make it valuable and worthwhile, which is why for me in Dream Team and Supercoach, we'll talk about AFL Fantasy in a sec, I don't see that 105. I actually don't even, I don't have confidence that for the year he'll be 100. So I can't start him because at that price, you're planning to have him as a premium for the year. Yeah, and that, that's what I was just going to say. There'd be people thinking, well, MJ, if you start with him and, and he doesn't hit the 105, but he still pushes 100, like that's still pretty good from where sure. he started. But I guess the key to that is that he then becomes a stepping stone to a, you know, a top, top dog, mm. and his starting price is just too high to be a stepping stone. You may as well bank 200 grand and, and get one of those real mid prices to be your stepping stone. Yeah, um, correct. Like it, for 160k thing, more, you're going to Josh Kelly in DT, for example. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, I, and I think the other thing too, if you do have, okay, no, I think he can get to 105. I, I guess um, you'd need to keep your ear to the ground over the preseason. Like for me, if I, I'd be seeing if, if just, Justin Longmuir in an interview says something along the lines of, uh, we really loved what he did, but we want to continue to develop his tank as a, and, and continue to give him run with roles, no chance he hits Of course, yeah. But if they say something like, um, oh, no, he, he's ready to go. We're looking at getting his tongue on ground up, as an <laughs> example. Um, there you go. So, yeah, keep, keep your ear to the ground. But, but your point, I think, essentially is, He's too expensive if he's just in, in the end going to be a stepping stone. Yeah, he's not he's a stepping stone. You've got to value him as a premium in Dream Team and Super Coach. And for me, I don't see that as a year long premium. He could be because we saw what he did do over the last five games. So it's a world where it could happen. But given the value around, given how big of a leap that is to do for a season long, and he'd need to be a premium for the year, for me, I, I'm looking elsewhere. AFL fantasy is a different conversation though. In that format, you're always looking for value with players. You've got two trades a week, use them or lose them. And so even if he does only go 95 over the first 16 weeks, well, he'll give you points on field and give you some cash generation and the chance to move. So he's much more viable in my mind to be in that format than the others. One in four coaches in AFL fantasy at the moment have him in their starting squad. So relatively popular. But it's an interesting price range, Jordox, of players in and around him. Um, just a couple of names that are really between 700,000 and 650,000. So you're not really going too far. These are the other guys that are competing with him or competing for multiple spots. Because I wonder how many of these guys we could have in our starting squads. These are just some of the names. Yo at 696,000, Cripps at 686,000, Shuey at 668,000, Warple right around that range, as to a Tim Kelly, Matt Crouch, a fraction under $650,000. And then if you want to look for some DPP mid forwards at a similar price range that all arguably have a history of either seasons or strong long runs where they've averaged 100 before, Canelio. Dusty, Taron Thomas, Jack Graham, Shy Bolton. That's 690 to 650 range. Dugowie is in that too, who we talked about just the other day in the 50 most relevant if he gets into the AFL system again. Um, man, how people rate Sarong versus these guys, I, I think is going to be quite, quite a unique set of orders, how people rank them. Absolutely. And, you know, something you said before about putting money on top of, of him as a starter, what, where can you get to? Um, you know, if you could drop a great 
player to look at as a similar player is Chera himself, who mm. in both, uh, well, in fantasy, but also DT is about 40 to 50K more. And he's a couple of years ahead and is probably statistically more likely to be the one to pop and go 105. Of course, he's gone to a new club and you know, there's sure. different variables there. But yeah, that, that list of players, um, even you know, Dangerfield is just a touch above yeah, that mark around, around the area. He? He'll be super unique. I guess from all those names, they're all kind of like, um, I can't, I don't know if you mentioned Noah Anderson because he's an exciting prospect. No, too, I left him out. All those, yeah, yeah. All those other guys, Cripps and Yo and, and those guys, they're all sort of injured. Guys have done it before. Will they get to that? But there's just something so appetizing about a kid breaking out that yeah, Sarong, out of all those names, stands out. But to your point, how many of you, how many of them can you have? Um, and with the, those absolute lock and load guys pushing or pushing a million bucks, yeah, you can't get stuck with too many of those mid-range guys. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating how people play the game in that format of the year. Do they do they choose one or just one of the likely big boys of the Millers, McRae's, Mitchells, Steels, Lions, etc., and then they just fill for value midfielders, or, or do they try to lock away two or three and only pick one or two? So it is going to be unique how people look to do it, and part of that is always going to be dependent on where do we have strong cash cows? At what price point are they? What's their job security and scoring abilities like? Where's the value in our stepping stones? Which line is it? Those elements ultimately do start to inform our starting squad structures. But for me, in Dream Team and Supercoach, I don't see him pushing the 105 marker. I think he'll he'll improve. I think 15 points per game um, across the formats is more than likely. 20 to, to push to the high 90s, maybe stretching, for the year, but it's definitely probable towards the 105 and getting 20, nearly 25 points per game of increase. I'm not convinced of that, which why for me, I'm not starting him in those formats, but AFL fantasy where he does provide value. And even if he only goes up 15 points per game and gives you a mid nineties, it's not heaps, but you might just get a pop a couple of ceiling games and, and make 50, 60, 70K cash out of him. And that's not too bad um, over the first eight weeks. So for me, he's, I think that's the format. If you're going on Sarong, that's the format. The others, um, I just can't get behind it. But good on you. If you see something to back him, I'd say to him, well, if as long as you know the narrative and you can data prove how you're going to get there, mm. back yourself in. But, but for me in those formats, I, I don't see it. Um, just yet, but drafts is interesting, Jordox, where he mm. goes. If it was a keeper league, he's a top 50 pick in, in my eyes. Um, mm. he, he, he's, he's definitely. Um, definitely got the fantasy chops. He's shown it as a kid and he's now shown him his two years at, at AFL league. He's a, he's a scorer and he's going to be a premium for us um, for many, many years to come. But it's going to be interesting in drafts in a single season how that goes. Do they come with that AFL fantasy salary cap hype? Do they come with a keeper league perspective where they know the breakout's coming, not they wonder if the breakout is coming? So his range of where he could go for people is really interesting for me. Where where would you feel comfortable, I suppose, more than predicting the range, where would mm. you feel comfortable? Is it M3? Is it M4, M5? Um, where would you feel comfortable having Sarong on your side on draft day? Oh, I, I think, look, M3, I think that would turn out to be okay. I wouldn't be too pumped about it, yeah. but M4, certainly. Um, it is going to be an interesting one. I think if you like him and you know, you've know you got your mind set on him, you're probably going to have to get him earlier than probably what is warranted. That's yes. because of, like you said, the salary cap hype is, is such a, you know, it's such a big thing. And even in people's minds, you know, oh, I really wanted to get him in, in my salary cap game, but I've made the right call not to. I'll try and snag him in my draft. Yeah. He's, um, yeah, he's an exciting name, but some people play it a bit differently and they just look at the average and let it slide. You know, a mid who averages 82 or whatever it is, um, he could sit on the board for a long time before he gets picked up. When you think about the forwards and the and the yeah. defenders that are going to fly through. So you could see him fall very late. So I know once I've 
established a couple of big boys in the midfield. And I've got the other lines, you know, have started. He's still there. Um, I'll be jumping on because I, I, um, I'm pretty bullish. I reckon he can have a good year. Yeah, I think he's going to be a good option for us this year. I think if you're desperate for him, you're going to have to reach to get him. And and, and a reach is an M3 in in my eyes. Um, M4 feels about right. M5 mm. starts to feel you've got some value, let alone anything yeah. beyond that. Um, but but all it takes is one coach to be bullish that he goes not just 105, but soars past that, that the last three is closer to the norm. And for them mm. sitting at their fifth pick in a draft going, all right, I've got a defender, a forward, I've got one or two mids. I'm going and I'm going now. I, I don't want to miss it. That's all it takes in a draft is someone to be careful. perfectly fine, but I would be very happy to see that happen. Yeah, you that early that stage early. of a draft, yeah. when you're turning away some really nice proven performers yeah. that you think are going to be upper tier options. So he's an interesting guy to watch. I think he's going to be very good this year. I don't think it's going to be enough in Dream Team and Super Coach, but I think he's going to be good for us this year. But over the long haul of his career, he is going to be a regular name in and around this 50 most relevant. He's a fantasy footballer. Make no mistakes about it. He, he scores in pretty much every column. He's courageous. He's daring. He's dashing. Wins the inside and the outside. Is prepared to put on the defensive stuff. And, and you will love to own this guy for a really long time. Is this his year? I think he'll be good this year, but I don't know if he'll be great enough to be the premium coaches are hoping he is. So it'll be interesting to see how the year for Caleb Sarong pans out. Hey, Jordox, appreciate your work today on this episode of the 50 Most Relevant. Pleasure, MJ. I'm, I'm really proud of myself. I got through the whole podcast without making a Sarong pun joke. Well done. Say before you, you're saying you can't go to ro- uh, something about being well right. done. Yeah, let's yeah, just leave well, it. <laughs> you'll just see yourself out, won't you? Uh, if you want to go and read the article <laughs> on Caleb, you can go and do that now at coachespanel.tv. All the other players revealed right before him. Yep. So from 37 back, you can go and read. There are thousands of words for you to go and read. So if you're just getting into your preseason now, going. Oh, I'm a little behind. Don't worry. We got you covered. There's heaps for you to do and check out the articles as are these podcasts dropping every single day, 15, 20, 30 minute episodes on every single one of these players, helping you make informed decisions about whether they're right for your team and your structure or not. If you haven't gone and checked them out yet, go back and check them out wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. If you're loving the coaches panel, there's a couple of ways you can support the coaches panel in the preseason. One, making sure you've followed and subscribed across the podcast channels and leaving a review the same at our youtube channel we're dropping videos uh pretty regularly over there new addition for the coaches panel is to drop in some videos during the 2022 season the other way you could support the coaches panel is tell your mates that play fantasy footy hey check out this article check out this podcast or the third uh, is you can become a financial support a partner with us and become a patreon member there are tiers at multiple levels and a stack of exclusive content and rewards that are right for you. So if you're loving the content you're getting this preseason, we'd encourage you to keep supporting the coaches panel in 2022. Number 35 in the 50 most relevant tomorrow. Whew. He's a guy that when I first put him down, I was like, no, 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 no. I, no he, he's, he doesn't belong in the 50. And then I put him in and went, mm. to put him in, means I've got to take another really good premium out of that line. Is he going to be better than him? Mm. Is he? Here's what I'll say about this guy. He is one of the elite players in the AFL. Now you go, oh, that's 30 players. No, 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 no. Think smaller. When you think of a player that can change a game, entire destiny on their own, like in a quarter, or in a 10, 15-minute patch, you go, this player changed the outcome of a game. He's one of a handful of players that can only do it. And he could just be way underrated as a fantasy option this year. Who is he? I'll tell you tomorrow in the 50 Most Relevant. Give it a-